So I would just like to thank um, the folks who organized um, this extremely illuminating conference, and I would like everyone to keep in mind that I wrote this before yesterday's proceedings. Um, so I look forward to knowing what you have to say about what I'm about to tell you. In the spring of 1950, Henri Fontaine wrote an intriguing letter to Albert Falquet of Kodak Pathé. The World War I veteran from Douai explained to Falquet that he hoped to sell, quote, a beautiful and important collection of calotypes. The collection consisted of 212 views. 124 of them were wax paper negatives, and 88 were salted paper and albumin silver prints, each measuring approximately 20 by 25 centimeters. They were made, Fontan explained, before 1856 and depicted sacred and secular architectural monuments in Normandy. In his letter, he listed Mont Saint Michel, Rouen, Louvier, Evreux, Caen, Saint Lô, Bayeux, Coutances, Avranches, and Falaise. To Fontaine, the photographs were of great significance because they functioned to revive the spiritual and artistic accomplishments of France's feudal and more recent past. Presumably, the glories of the feudal past were evident in the monuments pictured. The negatives and prints, on the other hand, were a testament to the triumph of French photography. In the letter, Fontaine paused to lament the destruction of Normandy during World War II, but he was quick to add that the region was the site of the country's deliverance, quote, executed by the will of the American nation and the gen genius of General Eisenhower. With the United States in mind, Fontaine finally came to his point. He asked, was not Falquet involved in an endeavor to establish a museum of photography? Fontaine knew very well that Kodak Pathé was only indirectly part of such an undertaking. He was, of course, alluding to the Eastman Kodak Company's efforts the year before, in 1949, to establish the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. And that was for you, Larry House. Fontaine shrewdly added that the photographs were offered, offered for sale were, quote, in all likelihood from the collection of Louis Desiree Blancart Evrard of Lille. In case the name was lost on Falquet, Fontaine reminded him that Blancard Evrard was, quote, one of the pioneers of art photography. Fontaine hit his mark. Falquet forwarded Fontaine's letter to Rochester, where Eastman House curator Beaumont Newhall mobilized a network of associates to acquire the calotypes. Since then, Fontaine's collection of calotypes, purchased for and donated to the museum by Kodak Pathé, has been known as the Blancart Everard Calle, of which there are five. During the negotiations between Newhall, his intermediaries, and Fontaine, Newhall accepted the connection between Blancart Everard and the Calle, asserted their significance to the history of photography, and promised to organize an exhibition dedicated to them. However, despite Newhall's stated intention, it appears that the Calle remained unexhibited unexhibited and understudied until Janet Berger's 1982 exhibition and catalog, The Era of the French Calotype. About the Calle's association with Blancart Evrard, Berger is rightly unwilling to make any definitive claims. However, she does provide what she calls circumstantial evidence. She cites the close proximity of Douai, Fontaine's hometown, to Lille, the similarity of the images to those Blancart Evrard is known to have published, and accompanying the cahier, a list written in a hand not unlike Blancart Everard's. Finally, Berger asserts that cahier one and two were made by a single photographer in Normandy. Numbers three through five, she notes, seem to have been made by several different photographers. She identifies, the, she identifies cahier five of being of special interest. That cahier contains three prints signed by Charles Bayou d'Avrancourt. Because of that, she wonders if all the negatives and prints in the Fontaine collection might in fact be by him. But she seems to dismiss the idea and go, goes on to list other candidates for authorship, including Hippolyte Bayard, 
Edmond Baco, Julien Blow, and Alphonse de Brébesson. I must admit that I too considered these names, along with Edmund Fairlance, a Belgian who worked in Brussels and was trained in France. And by the way, I thank Stephen Joseph for assuring me these were not Fairlance photographs. Today I hope to demonstrate that the evidence that originally suggested an association between the Calle and Blancart Evrard, in fact, strengthens their ties to Bayou d'Abrancourt. In 1950, when the museum received the collection, the photographs were housed in what Fontan described as period paper folders. Unfortunately, the museum did not preserve the folders. Fontan's list indicates that there were five. Of the five folders, those dedicated to Normandy, numbers one and two, appear to have included interleaving, uh, annotated interleaving sheets separated each, separating each negative. Fortunately, the museum retained the inscriptions on the sheets, and these are cut out and mount, dry mounted to um, paper, like typing paper. On those sheets, the photographer identified the pictured architectural monument and noted the negative number, which he also wrote on the verso of the negative. The inscriptions indicate that the photographer organized Normandy's, the Normandy photographs into two suites. So Calle is something that Photon made up later, and you'll see this as I continue. And I said made up, and I mean that. Um, recently, the museum organized the photographs according to the suite number and negative order established by the photographer. In the catalog records, we also transcribed the numbers and inscriptions. The entire collection is not only fully cataloged, but also digitized. Rectos and versos, and in the case of the negatives, an ambient and transmitted light. The first two suites are the only ones that contain, pack, contain wax paper negatives. They also have the most thorough te contemporary documentation. Together, suites one and two consist of 122 wax paper negatives and 25 salted paper and albumin silver prints. A given negative is sometimes accompanied by a corresponding print, but just as often, the negative for one of the extant prints is missing. Occasionally, the photographer exposed two negatives of a scene in succession. And finally, the numbered interleaving sheets from the original folder indicate that the photographer made at least 193 exposures in Normandy. When the museum received the collection, approximately 67 negatives were missing from the folders. In other words, the negatives were missing when the collection arrived in Rochester. And those horrible X's there just indicate um, negatives that we do not have and that we never received. The current full content of the suites is not widely known. For this reason, I would like to introduce them to you in greater detail. And hold on to your hats, because the slides are going to go by quickly. Suite 1 consists of 48 negatives and 16 prints of secular and sacred architectural monuments in Rouen, Louvier, and Caen. In Rouen, the photographer made several cityscapes and views on the city streets. He mostly photographed the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the Church of saint Maclou, the Palace of Justice, the Hotel Berg de Rode, and the Church of saint ouen In Louvier, he concentrated on the Church of Notre Dame, and the Caen photographs in the first suite depict the Church of Saint-Pierre. The Caen excursion continues in suite two, which consists of 74 paper negatives and nine prints. In suite two, the Caen highlights include clockwise from upper left, the Abbé aux Hommes, the Abbé aux Dames, the Gendarme, and the Church of Saint-Jean. Saint in Saint Lou, the photographer was intrigued with, as, as intrigued with the cathedral as he was with Francois Letrigui's bookstore and home, seen at the bottom of the slide. The bookstore opened in 1853, which indicates that the photographer made his tour of Normandy in or after that year. At Bayou and Evreux, the photographer thor thoroughly documented each cathedral and at Falaise, the castle of William the Conqueror, churches, and the landscape. Mont Saint-Michel evidently captivated the photographer. There he exposed 27 negatives, of which 16 are extant. In suites one and two, the contemporary inscriptions that accompany the negatives and prints lent authority to Fontan's claim in 1950 that the notebooks had belonged to Blancart Everard. 
Indeed, the inscriptions appear to be the only evidence Fontan ever produced in support of his assertion. Fontan's slightly earlier correspondence re reveals that the Blancard Everard Association was one he settled on over time. In 1949, the year before Fontan approached Kodak Pathé, he had written directly to Beaumont Newhall in Rochester. In comparison, the earlier letter is short and vague. In the letter itself, he mentioned nothing of Blancart Everard, but at the head of an enclosed eight-page list, he conjectured two attributions, Talbot or Blancart Everard. The attributional pairing of Talbot and Blancart Everard must have struck Newhall as odd and therefore unworthy of remark. On the other hand, perhaps the curator was simply too distracted with the imminent opening of the museum in the fall of 1949 to pay attention from a stranger to Douay. In any case, the curator apparently did not answer Fontan's 1949 letter. A year later, when Fontan uh, contacted Falquet at Kodak Pathé, he had settled on Blancart Everard. As I've mentioned, Fontan's claim rests primarily on the 19th century inscriptions that accompany the first two suites. In August of 1950, Ferdinand Ryer, a friend of Newhall's, was in Paris and inspected the materials on Newhall's behalf. Ryer wrote to Newhall, convinced that the suites had belonged to Blancart Everard. In his opinion, they were, quote, Blancart Everard's workbooks. So in English, it's Cahiers. In addition to the so-called Blancart Everard Cahiers, Fontan also owned two titles by the Lille publisher, Traité de Photographie sur Papier of 1851 and La Photo Photographie of 1869. Into Traité, Royer Re reported, was laid a seven-page manuscript of for 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 photographic formula. The other book, La Pho Photographie, was a, pre a presentation copy inscribed and signed by Blancart Everard. Ryer was convinced of the congruity of the three handwriting samples, the seven-page manuscript, the inscription signed by Blancard Everard, and the captions in suites one and two. He cited this as proof of the Cahiers' connection of Blancard Everard. Eight weeks later, Ryer again wrote to Newhall, but rather than repeat his former conviction, he hedged. Ryer was now only pretty certain that the suites were Blancard Everard's workbooks. He put the burden of proof squarely on Fontan. During their Paris meeting, he had insisted that Fontan produce written documentation clarifying the provenance and as much proof as possible that these indeed were Blancart Everard's workbooks. According to Ryer, Fontan promised to do so and also eagerly proposed a trip to Lille uh, to the archive to dig up evidence. Ryer evidently assured Fontan that for his efforts, he would be given credit and quote, and this is good, Rochester immortality. What an inducement. Alas, the promise of fame in Rochester did not motivate Fontan. It appears he never delivered the documentation. The penmanship of the seven page manuscript laid into Traité de Photographie is indeed identical to that in suites one and two. Moreover, the manuscript suggests that the photographer had intended to make an excursion to travel with photographic equipment and to make photographs in the field. Fontan might have acquired the publication with the suites, but it also cannot be ruled out that he might have only acquired the suites and an anonymous manuscript together and then laid the manuscript into the book to strengthen the suites association with Blancart Everard. The book, no matter whether Fontan acquired it with or without the manuscript laid in, is not sufficient evidence to prove the Cahiers were Blancart Everards. If the book did in fact belong to the photographer of the suites, it would at most suggest the trajectory and extent of a photographic education. To understand the suites, the book is arguably less important than the seven-page manuscript. For now, and for now I'll refer to the photographer of the suites simply as the photographer. The manuscript indicates that he received a lesson in photography from Mr. Pouche, probably in advance of the trip to Normandy. Located in Paris at the Rue de l'Arcade 15 on the ground floor of the Heliographic Society, Pouche was a leading figure in the sale of photographic supplies and equipment and is known to have taught Roger Fenton in 1851. 
The photographer took notes as Poosh disclosed to him a brief and it seems altered version of the preparations required of Gustave Legray's wax paper negative process. Poosh evidently also recommended papers for positive cancel cancel frere paper, which in fact the photographer used, we know this from watermarks, and for everything else, Tilly paper. The photographer also noted other supplies needed for travel, including a cap and case for the lens and a travel sack for the camera. Two inscriptions on the inner leaving sheets of Suite 2 suggest the photographer received further lessons while traveling in Normandy. At Fillets, he met two distinguished practitioners, Julien Blow, whom he identified as an amateur photographer, and Alphonse de Brébesson. Uh, Blow and Brébesson had both contributed photographs of Normandy's architecture to Blancard Everard, Everard's publications in 1851 and 1853-54, respectively. No doubt delighted to be in such distinguished company, our photographer exposed two negatives, numbers 151 and 152, of um, neither of which are extant, of each man posed before the cliffs of fillets. With such figures as Pouche, Blow, and Brébesson, it is clear that our photographer moved in heady circles. Although suites four and three, four, and five are somewhat different than one and two, they are arguably the key to arriving at a viable identification of the photographer. The last three suites contain no negatives, but the salted paper and albumin prints in them were all printed from paper negatives. And like the prints in suites one and two, they were made with negatives measuring approximately 20 by 25 centimeters. In other words, there is a uniformity of format across all five suites, which suggests the work of a single photographer, perhaps one who left Paris equipped with only one camera. The 65 photographs constituting the three last suites were made outside of Normandy, in Paris, in unidentified settings, in the central Loire Valley, and in Belgium. For suites one and two, as we have seen, the photographer created a careful record of his work. <coughs> suites three through five, on the other hand, lack con contemporary documentation, with the exception of three prints signed by Charles Bayou d'Abrancourt. Fontan seems to have preserved suites three, three through five as he found them, and the remnants of the folders seem to be uh, made of the same paper as that for suites one and two. However, he attempted to redress the photographer's insufficient record keeping, and this is, this is all Fontan's handwriting. For suite three, on the inner leaving sheets and print versos, Fontan supplied numbers, and where he could, and with varying degrees of accuracy, identification of monuments and place names. But he must have grown weary of the exercise. For suites four and five, he made only cursory summaries of the contents, again with varying degrees of accuracy, or he attempted none at all. For example, Fontan identified the Gothic runes in Suite 3 as Jumiège, and I, I just don't think this is Jumiège, and the tower of the Tour Cathedral as an unspecified Parisian church. It is understandable that he did not attempt to ident identify the locations of sundry country houses and scenes, and in fact, I didn't either. In addition, a few of the prints appear to have been made in Normandy and described in Suites 1 and 2, but had been, by the time Fontan acquired the collection, jumbled together with the prints in the remaining suites. In general, suites three, four, and five are disorganized. Perhaps Fontan's most significant identification was of three photographs in suite five. Fontan thought they were of Honfleur, but in fact, they are of Antwerp. Only recently corrected, the misidentification has to some extent obscured the suite's association with Belgium. In fact, Fontan had difficulty with all of the Belgian views. He later corrected several errors, but originally he had mislabeled Notre Dame of Dinant and Our Lady Cathedral in Antwerp as churches in Normandy. Fontan had believed that the triumphal arches erected in Brussels in July of 1856, on the occasion of Leopold I's 25th Jubilee, were meant to celebrate a visit by Napoleon to an unknown Normandy city in the same year. And again, I'd like to thank um, Stephen Joseph, who. Um, who um, verified the dates and supplied um, the titles for these works. The photographs he called, he called depictions of the Normandy port of Honfleur are in fact of the Colfleet Canal in Antwerp. In two of the photographs, aside from the architecture typical of the Low Countries, the distinctive tower of St. Palace Kerk stands in the distance. 
These three photographs suggest that several others also picturing fishing boats may have likewise been made in or around Antwerp. The relative neglect and mistaken identification of the Belgian photographs leaves one to wonder whether as yet unidentified views might also have been made in Belgium, particularly the landscapes. <coughs> Bayou d'Avrancourt signed three prints in Suite 5, two depicting landscapes and one of the partially scaffolded facade of Amiens Cathedral. Although it is problematic to generalize from a single instance, Bayou d'Avrancourt's photograph of the cathedral shares stylistic char characteristics with images in the Normandy suite. The Normandy photographer often pre preferred to position his camera slightly elevated relative to the subject matter, but no matter where he stood, higher or at ground level, he consistently composed the views from an ob oblique angle. Admittedly, in the case of the Amiens Cathedral, the photographer's decision to photograph the facade from an oblique position may have been an attempt to frame out the scaffolded left portal. Nevertheless, I would argue uh, the composition calls to mind strategies employed in the other suites. The two landscapes signed by Bayou d'Abrancourt are also remarkably similar to other landscape views in Suite 5, not only stylistically, but also in terms of the paper and print quality. The prints in all five suites also include printed in clouds, executed with varying degrees of accomplishment. The consistency of these aspects Format, style, the nature of the prints, and it turns out, although um, our conservators, Tina Meller and Zach Long, have to perform more um, experimentations, that the, the prints are highly experimental also. Don't ask me too much about that because I can't give you the, the, the precise scientific details. So the consistency of these aspects points to a single photographer, an amateur attempting both to master the technology of the medium and to articulate his aesthetic position in the field. These strivings, in fact, recommend Bayou d'Abrancourt as, as the photographer responsible for the suites. The first published account of Charles Bayou d'Abrancourt's appearance on the photographic scene is in an 1856 bulletin of the French Photographic Society. There it is noted, the count presented three landscape views to the members of the society during the April 18th meeting of that year. Like Blancart Everard, the count was from Lille. There he was born to a prominent family in 1827 and died in the city in 1895. If Fontan acquired the suites in or near Lille, Bayou d'Avrancourt's residency there makes him an equally compelling source of the suites as Blancart Everard. In addition, Bayou d'Avrancourt's prominent standing would have positioned him to take private lessons from the likes of Pouch. Regarding the photographer's established relationship with Pouch, one must question if between 1853 and 1856, Blancart Everard would have required such a tutorial. I, I doubt it. Um, Bayou d'Avrancourt's social standing would also have facilitated connections with figures such as Brébesson. And who knows, maybe he also knew Blancart Everard himself. From Rochester, I was unable to conduct archival research about him or his family, but from what I was able to find online, Bayou d'Avrancourt had strong ties to Belgium. Indeed, in 1866, he married a well-born Belgian woman. The marriage announcement indicates that they were to reside on a estate in Ruderforda near Bruges. It seems the couple divided their time between Ruderforda and Lille. Moreover, after 1870, he at least for a time made Belgium his permanent home. As a French royalist, he fled, fled to Belgium immediately after the fall of Napoleon III. There he purchased the Castle of the Three Kings near Bernam, which like Roderferda is near Bruges. After mention of him in the 1856 Society Bulletin, Bayou d'Avrancourt's standing in photography circles experienced a decided upswing. He joined the ranks of distinguished pra practitioners such as Bacot and Bayard. In 1857, Charles Chevalier included a description of Bayou d'Avrancourt's wax paper negative process the novelty of which lay in his use of gold chloride. In, in 1859, Chevalier again published Bayou's d'Avrancourt's formulas. By this date, however, the Count had retired his wax paper negative process in favor of collodion, collodion on glass. As far as I can tell, the glass negatives of Bayou d'Avrancourt are lost. Indeed, the three signed prints in suite five, all printed from paper negatives, appear to be the only surviving testament to his photographic records. There are few amateurs, wrote Chevalier, of in, who are as zealous about photography 
as Mr. Bayou d'Abrancourt. None perhaps have produced as many proofs as he, and all of his proofs are pretty and made with taste, and to a high degree demonstrate the union of the two qualities which alone can bring perfection. First, the surety and skill of manipulation, and second, artistic feeling. Perhaps these suites, if they are in fact by Bayou d'Abrancourt, represent the photographer's initial efforts, his first step to attain these two qualities. I have argued against the suite's association with Blancard Evrard and for their association with Bayou d'Abrancourt, but many questions remain. Central among them is the question of handwriting, the evidence on which Fontan made his original claim in 1950. Like Newhall in 1950 and ja Janet Berger in 1982, today we are still armed with only these scraps of evidence, and they are not entirely conclusive. In many ways, the inscriptions Bayou d'Avrancourt made in books, the only such samples available to me, have more in common with the sweet captions and accompanying seven-page manuscript than with Bayou d'Avrancourt's signature. And I actually think there's something kind of funny about the signature, but you all can tell me if you think I'm wrong. Nevertheless, if we accept Bayou d'Avrancourt's authorship, it opens a new perspective on the suites. Instead of the work of Blancard Everard, they become the work of an amateur. This amateur sought out a photographic education in Paris, proved himself during an ambitious photographic tour of Normandy, forged relationships with important photographers during his travels, and perhaps also took his newfound skills abroad to Belgium. If the suites can possibly be considered the work of Bayou d'Abrancourt, they provide a rich new source for the further stu study of photographers' networks in France and abroad and the training and practice of an ambitious amateur. Now that they are cataloged, digitized, and fully accessible, the suites are available to scholars as they never were before. With this paper, I hope to spark a conversation about the suites, and I also hope someone will take up the, um, the challenge and provide a more detailed analysis of them in the future. Thank you. Euh, Est-ce que vous avez quelques questions à, à poser à Heather Shannon avant que nous passions à, la, à notre deuxième session The other thing is I have all of this stuff on my computer which I brought with me in case anyone wants to stroll through all 200 and something photographs. I would actually really invite that. Um. I, have to, I have to put this on unless you ask in English. Uh, je préfère, I prefer to ask in French. <laughs> um, je crois que nous sommes plusieurs, en tout cas, à pouvoir vous remercier pour cette, uh, cette conférence parce que je pense que je ne suis pas la seule, enfin, certainement, à m'être intéressée, intéressée à cette question. Une question très simple que je voulais vous poser puisque vous avez uh, comparé les écritures notre possibilité pour compliquer encore serait que ce ne soit pas l'auteur qui ait écrit les légendes. Vous avez comparé la signature avec les légendes, mais vous pouvez imaginer que la femme belge très riche ou un assistant aurait aidé le photographe et que ce serait l'écriture d'encore une autre personne que l'auteur, ce qui et qui ne reste écrit lui-même que que, que le, la signature. Enfin, je ne sais pas. Uh, yes, I totally agree with you, but I think at I think at this point, um, for hand, better handwriting analysis, um, I think we have to go back to archival sources, which I absolutely don't have access to. Um, but I, yes, it did occur to me that someone else might have done this work, uh, the handwriting, the notes. But it also occurred to me that um, maybe someone else simply put his name on the prints. I realize that that, that is maybe um, an anathema to us these days, someone signing someone else's work. Um, but it, it, it's a possibility. Um, I, I, while I admitted or sort of admitted that the, the, the inscriptions on the uh, from the interleaving sheets 
have more, more in common with Blancart Everard. I still don't think that's his handwriting. Um, but I don't know that it, so more work needs to be done. And I actually, after yesterday's um, meeting, which was so illuminating, I maybe the way to go is actually a technical investigation, which would be thrilling, of course.